Hey, a pleasant good evening, everybody. This is Joe Borg from Sports Mag News, joined by the wonderful Yarif Wallach from Nyers Nitty Gritty, who I'm also a part of. We love that site. Please check us out there. Check out Chris's coverage, his coverage, and Caitlin's coverage of all the games, as well as uh, when I will be there later in February, and then maybe down in the future, um, other people as well for a great site like the Great Land Screen. And I'm also joined by the great Steel Flyers from SteelFlyers.com that I'm also privileged to be a part of. Please check out the site over there as well. So now that we got all our introductions out of the way, let's get right into our Flyers. They started the season three and one, not the most peachy keen three and one, maybe as some people would put it. But, you know, it's three and one and that's what we count. What counts is the win column, not how you get to the win column. So I'll start with your reef on this one. What have been your first like three? We'll go with three since it's been a few games. Inklings about the Flyers so far. Your first three thoughts about the Flyers as you think of this season. Sure. I, I, I probably have a lot more than three, but let's, let's <laughs> my, first, my first thing is sign of a really good team or one that wins even when they don't play their best hockey. Um, you saw that with teams like Tampa Bay, who, if you guys recall, I, people probably will forget this now, but there are many nights where the Flyers severely outplayed Tampa Bay and would lose 3 nothing. It would happen all the time because Tampa Bay had a better goalie, and when the opportunity came, they would bury their opportunity. So I think what we are watching is a contender. And, you know, the injuries are obviously going to be an issue. So that's been nice. The other thing I've noticed is that JVR has been one of the hardest working players consistently every single night. Course, AV's course. pointed something out. I mean, I've noticed it. I even noticed it um, in the exhibition game. And we talked about it on um, Getting Gritty With It as well on the podcast, Flyers uh, Nitty Gritty podcast. And we were joking around about it. Like, could JVR actually pull it in the season? And we were skeptical. But he looks like, uh, I don't want to say a new player, but he looks like his old self. And that's really awesome to see when he kind of uh, had a really great year, actually, a couple of years ago. Um, and if he's really playing that way, I did see last night uh, at times he was playing with Drew and Frost in the middle. If you actually just remove Frost there, you insert Couturier. That could actually be your top line at some point during the season. Then you roll that Nolan Patrick line. You roll the um, the Hayes line with uh, Faraby and, um, and Voracek. And all of a sudden, your top nine is probably as balanced as it was in the beginning of the season and maybe even more balanced now with JVR performing. So that's been really cool. Um, and then overall, it's just interesting to see um, how the games in the around the NHL have just been up and down. Um, and people shouldn't waver just because they haven't seen the best game from the Flyers. Um, my thing is what I watched last night was the team slowly take over a game. Um, and that's what we saw last season. So I'm seeing hints of that. So uh, I, considering what's happened with the injuries – um, and the, the way the team has performed on the ice consistently, which hasn't been great, 3-1 I think is a great way to start the season. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, 3-1 and one is definitely a great way to start. You brought up Morgan Frost, too, who it's very unfortunate uh, he injured. It looked like his wrist. There's an MRI. that Did we get the information yet on that mm -hmm. or no? It was supposed to come back that. today. Okay, yeah. So supposed to get results on that soon, I'm assuming. But that's unfortunate because that's Frost's first injury, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think he's got injured yet in uh, his career. And that's obviously when you got a big opportunity. And you were playing really well, in my opinion, that game, too. He looked pretty good out there on the ice. That's just very unfortunate. We hope him and Myers are able to come back as soon as possible, um, especially because both of those guys have looked really good. Uh, Frost for the few games he's been in, and then Myers the entire season thus far for the most part. Uh, so, But, Steele, what is your first couple inklings on the team before we go in depth? Well, there's one thing that I think that everybody was <clears throat> clamoring about uh, at the beginning, and that was about Gustafson. Gustafson has done some good things and he's done some bad things. Uh, you know, look, you, you got to accept the bad with the good. Uh, you know, he's he's done some good things. He's set up some some great plays and he's done some good things. And he's also done some real bonehead things. And like, what are you doing? You know, and just giving the puck away. OK, so I think that's going to be a getting used to kind of thing. Uh, the fact that we're still missing uh, Gossip Bear, I think, is is a bivy of that kind of thing situation going on there with with Gustafson just because we haven't seen Ghost yet and we're not really sure what the status of his coming out. So I think that's that's a, one of the factors that I think uh, that I would look at for the Flyers. The other thing I've been really impressed with is the play of Joel Farabee. 
I really like how this kid has come on. He's got a new number. Uh, he's got a new attitude. He's He's got a little bit more weight to him. He's a little bigger, a little thicker, a little faster, a little stronger. You know, and and he's up on his skates, and man, he's he's been playing pretty well as far as I'm concerned. I've been really impressed with his, uh, you know, moving up to the next level. You know, we saw him flashes of it last year and in the playoffs a little bit, and then this year he's just kind of taking the bull by the horns. Um, he's done some more, you know, tape study and stuff like that for the game, and so um, I just think he's been uh, a great surprise for the flyers as well too um the other thing i think that uh, i really like as well too about what the flyers are doing is this we haven't been playing our best hockey but the coach is still rolling with basically the same lineup he's tweaking things here and there but for the most part it's like okay this is the team that has to suck it up and do it OK, and they haven't played their best hockey and we and they have been outplayed uh, in numerous times, especially in big stretches during the first two games against the Penguins. And then obviously that stinker game that they dropped against uh, Buffalo Sabres. But then exactly with what you guys both pointed on is that they started to take the game over again in the second game against Buffalo. So that right there, I think, is although they haven't played their best, you guys both touched on that slightly, but they still managed to um, find a way to, to get six out of the eight points available in the first four games. Yeah, uh, yeah, they definitely never made any on the surface um, other than the fact that Frost had to come in. Lineup changes, he does obviously do what A.V. does and moves people around when he sees fit uh, during the game and usually does a pretty good job at doing so, like moving Sanheim up with Provia at times, which actually looked really good. Yeah, in yeah, my yeah. Opinion, and you're going to see some things now good. because obviously Frost and, and Myers are going to be out for more periods of time now. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to see if Frost is a more extended thing or if that was a thing that looked worse um, and wasn't as bad as it was, which is hopeful. Um, but we'll have to see what that comes <laughs> out to be. Because, I mean, I've been impressed early on, obviously, uh, with um, a guy like Carter Hart was able to, yes, he allowed in a few goals, but that's because our defense, a few goals he let in, uh, other than the one, obviously, that was a blunder behind the net, and the other one that went right over his equipment that he said he probably would have wanted to have back in the um, uh, Buffalo game, we lost 6-1. to one. But other than those couple goals, he's been really sharp, and it's still been the same Carter Hart able to save us. He had one, if you even want to call it a blunder of a game, because our whole team had a blunder of a game in that Buffalo game. And other than that, he's looked really good. And then obviously, I mean, after sitting for months <laughs> – I have to give a shout out to Brian Elliott for coming in and having a 40 save shutout laying on his back for some save, getting <laughs> stretching across like for, on that one save, like he was like his 27 year old self. Um, like the, the guy somehow just doesn't stop to seize to amaze uh, us as our backup because it's like he just. It's like he's one of those guys that you can just say, hey, we're going now. Oh, I haven't done this in five years. And then and then all of a sudden he's just like, oh, yeah, I made 50 saves. And you, uh, like it, it just do, it just doesn't make uh, any sense whatsoever. Like he's a guy that I would want to have when he retires in an alumni game, because I guarantee you, if you have that man in an alumni game, you're winning that because he could probably not play for 10 years and <laughs> he'll, he'll just jump in and be making <laughs> saves left and right somehow. And you're winning that alumni game like 17 to two just because Brian Elliott decided to be a stand up goalie again for one day. Um, but yeah, he's very impressive. I'm very impressed by him. You shouted out Joel Fairby. Obviously, uh, he's been huge. Um, you got the battle of the 386s now in the uh, division. Uh, you got the Crosby, you got the Hughes, you got the Fairby. One is a elder statesman now, two are the younger budding stars of the league. So uh, we'll see what Cros goes. Crosby's yeah. 87. 87. Oh, 87, 87. Yeah, excuse me. You got the battle of the two young uh, 86s. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, that's all right, man. That's okay. We got but, you. Uh, yeah, but uh, that's a very good battle you're going to have with Hughes and uh, Farabee because Jack Hughes, just like Joel Farabee, has come out like a bat out of hell this year and has produced. Uh, he was literally the sole reason that the New Jersey Devils won their game yesterday. Um, probably, I mean, realistically, because he stepped up big time and was the whole reason he got them over the hump. I mean, I don't, I don't think they would have. Do you agree, Steele? Do you think they would, they would have won? that game that they got smoked otherwise by the Rangers 50 to 28 in shots like that was literally, oh, man. That was, that was yeah. literally uh, 
Blackwood and Hughes. So it's going to be a nice battle. And that's the other reason why I wanted to bring that up. You're going to have a great battle of two young goalies in this division, too, for the foreseeable. And three, if Shesterkin keeps developing, because look what Blackwood's becoming for the Devils and what Hart's becoming for us. Those are going to be some really high-oriented, highlight, real potential top 10 plays, saves uh, games when you uh, play those guys. So there's a lot of excitement amongst the uh, division budding, too, with how good a lot of the young guys are doing, and I'm definitely excited to see that going forward as well. But, Yurik, you pointed out James Van Riemsdyk. He has been uh, a very noticeable, even when he doesn't get a point, he just seems like he's back to how he was before in Toronto when he was first here in Philly and the first year he came back where he's playing more tenacious and actually going to the corners, getting in front of the net like he wanted him to, where for some reason last year he played more on the sidewall a little bit, where now he's actually getting back to his basics and getting in front of the net and doing his thing. And I agree with you, that's huge. Um, but I think a big thing we obviously have to discuss uh, in the first five games is what have you guys seen as each game has gone on from the five on five play? Because even the players have discussed how that's been something they've wanted to improve, even through the two Pittsburgh wins. They thought they needed to improve their defense and numbers on the five on five play. So for this one, I'll start with Steele. What have you thought about any improvements and just our five on five play overall from uh, each game progressing to now? Uh, very much so. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think that with what AV's doing and and the lines that he's putting out there, even though he's had to shuffle things around a little bit, especially with uh, Couturier going down within the first forty five seconds of the second game, so he's basically been shuffling lines since almost beginning of the season, especially without Couturier. You know what I mean? I've been very impressed with how Nolan Patrick has really stepped up responsible for three goals or three points and also doing 44% in the faceoff dot. Okay. And he's been out there taking more and more of those types of important faceoffs. You know what I mean? Um, and so I, I really like what, Everybody's doing on the team as far as how they're skating. I like the fact that they're all buying into the same system, and I think that's why we're getting an improvement on the five-on-five. Five. Yeah, that makes sense once you all buy in. Also, uh, Jamie, I know when we were watching the game on Tuesday that we laid a um, – or excuse me, on uh, Monday that we laid an egg uh, – that was – you're not going to adjust to Sean Couturier as a Selkie winner being out of your lineup in one game. If you did, that would be highly impressive. And AV might want to just win the coach of the year based off of one game because that's pretty darn impressive if you adjust to losing the best defender in hockey in, one, in that quickly. So you saw that adjustment come into the next game. And like you're right. Patrick stepped up. Uh, JVR stepped up more. And that's why they were able to win um, – last night rather than actually get the L and that's the difference making when you're able to have different guys step up Limblum was good on the defensive end and, and uh that's a big thing and then obviously we know AV loves that Lord and Rafa and all Bay Kubel line he started them to go against and really defend the other team oh, but man, um Knack has been playing really well yeah yeah, like I always said uh, in my article last year, usually I just call him knack attack at this point since he's one of the best four checkers in the league. It makes sense. But, uh, Yarif, what do you think of our five-on-five -five play thus far and how it's grown from the start to now? I, I honestly have been disappointed with their five-on-five -five play. Um, I've, dis I, I've actually been disappointed with everybody's play um, outside of Brian Elliott and JVR. Um, and a little bit of Provorov to some degree, but it, not so much as like I want to pick on people individually, but I just don't see the execution passes out of the zone. Um, majority of the games have been very sloppy. They're relying on their talent, and they are a more talented team, despite what Flyers fans, whether they want to agree with me or not, I don't care. Um, they're, my, in my opinion, probably the most talented team in the division on paper. Um, so it, even losing Sean Couturier, I was talking to Jamie about it as well. I don't think it's an excuse um, not to lose 6-1. Maybe to lose the game, maybe to maybe to, to lose some matchups, but to lose 6-1, you could be the worst team in the league and not lose 6-1. So I, I don't think it's really an excuse. I think the team just, they didn't want it as much as the other team. The other team was a lot more desperate. The Sabres really needed a win. It's not that I think they're lazy or anything like that, but you have to come hungrier than the other team, or at least as hungry. Um, and I think in Game 3, or I'm sorry, game four, it started off that way as well. And then the team kind of, we started seeing what they really are, which is when they actually play well, five on five, they start to shut the game down. And a lot of down, so 
eliminated. And Elliott had to stand on his head, especially early on. He did a little bit at the end. Flyers really started locking the game down. Um, I think the lines will be interesting. I think they will still continue to evolve. Um, so we see some of those changes. But I love the Nolan Patrick line right now, the Lindblom. Yeah. TK. I mean, I've been talking about that for a few years. We've seen it before in the past a little bit. Um, oh, but and boy, I, has it paid off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, talk so, about that because that was going to be my next topic anyway. So just go into right, so let's Well, let's go into that line. I mean, let's just say on paper that line is perfect, and that doesn't mean much. But on paper, it's perfect, right? Like Limblom is incredibly responsible. He's an offensive two-way uh, left winger, which you couldn't ask for more really um, as a compliment. You have Patrick who does it all. He's essentially – um, a hybrid between Giroux and Couturier, somewhere in between in the middle of them. And then you have, like, uh, TK, who's essentially, like, a Mark Recchi type. So you're really looking at, like, Recchi, Lindros, and you could say Leclerc, but it's not really Leclerc and Lindbaum's case, right? But we're always kind of chasing those ghosts. Um, but on paper, it works. They've grown here together. I think it is what the Flyers will probably roll with. Um, I think Sean Couturier and G will find their way back together. Um, maybe JVR will be the person to take that spot up there. And maybe Voracek kind of moves around. Joel Farabee, I agree. I think he will be a PK mainstay by the end of the year. He kind of already is that. His five-on play, five-on-five five play has been maybe the best of the forwards. Um, I think Hayes could do a little bit better. Um, but having said that, I don't think they played poorly. Um, I think they played well enough to win these games. Um, but I just want to see a tighter game. But it's expected. No training camp. And, and Steele, you mentioned Gustafson earlier, and I think we're all worried about his defensive play. The one thing I am like cautioning myself personally because you know, you see the level of defensive play. Obviously, the offensive game is there. But no training camp, and he's brand new to the team. Yeah, so I yeah. do kind of give it a, a benefit of the doubt. But I will yep. say this, and I'll end it on this note. I, I hope that people realize the value of somebody like Shane Goss bear today and to understand what he actually brings to the table and that he's not just some offensive defenseman. Players who can play drive the way Ghost has done in the past, Gustafson cannot do that. He's a brilliant shot, great hands. He cannot move like Shane Gosper. That is a rare gift. So if Ghost can come back to play, he can still be a large impact this year. And I think that's at least nice to see perspective-wise. Yeah, I think it is too. I think it was, I can't remember which one of Randall's tweeted. I believe it was Charlie. O'Connor that said the same things Gus has been doing recently are the things that people have been getting on Ghost for the past couple years. Um, and not as many people are screaming to the mountains about uh, Gus so far. And I think it's because, like you said, it might be because he's new. It might be because they don't know him a lot yet. But I think it more so just has to do with for some reason, our city always has that one guy on each team that they seem to point towards. Mm -hmm. And it feels like that's Gustafson, obviously, with the Flyers, with the Phillies, when they had Kapler, it was all the manager. Everybody pointed it was all his fault. Everybody else was great. Of the So, like, yeah. they, there's always somebody to uh, point to, yeah. usually that one scapegoat. Yeah, and hey, I feel Mac. like for some reason, yeah, Matt McDonald before, go yeah, that was McDonald. Yeah, exactly. So there's always that. And then it was Luke Shen when we traded for Luke Shen because that was a yeah. terrible trade. Yeah. Uh, but, um. That's but you know what, a, that's you can another. probably even throw Justin Braun into that mix, too, because he hasn't necessarily been all that standout-ish either. I mean, honestly, I, out of I, position. well, that that's the other part of it, too. But I think that everybody else around him has been playing rel relatively well. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, I, and I, uh, I, I think sorry. he's just kind of brought in for either – I don't know. Look, I was not a fan of the team signing him. I understand they were looking for that, uh, you know, veteran presence uh, and, and, and with losing Niskanen and all that other stuff. But I was just not a fan of, of signing Justin Braun because I just I think there's other players that might might have a better shot at, at the at being at, in the lineup than him. Yeah, it's also, I think, the one line this year. Normally, like I've always said this to Yarif and Jamie, too, I don't normally ever question when AV moves guys around because normally he moves them around and it works well. The one thing that didn't make much sense was having Hag and Braun together because you have one guy that's a big guy that blocks shots that's just more defensive with another guy that's <laughs> older now that can't move. That is pretty much the same thing from the right-handed side, but he just can't move because he's 34 now. Or 33. So that's why that that pairing didn't necessarily make sense to me. Braun does all the nice small things. The problem is you have to pair him with someone that can move. You don't want to 
put two guys that are sl- that are more anchors that are not as quick with on a line. That's the where if Friedman comes in, if he doesn't end up playing up on the top line and they keep Provy and Sanheim together, I wouldn't be shocked if they put him with Hag since Hag's a little bit more of the anchor and Friedman's more of a guy that we saw last year takes what's given to him, but will go up a little bit when needed. And then we'll come back at times also when needed. And we also saw that in Lehigh for anybody that watches their games a bit as well. He does both things pretty well and doesn't seem to get caught much. So that could make sense there. And he actually is a little bit loose, elusive on his skates skates a little bit. So. Friedman has the offensive upside to him, and I agree with what you're saying there. He actually has the ability if, from college hockey. He was like an offensive yeah. guy there. Yeah. Um. If if Friedman was three inches taller, he would be in the lineup already. Yeah. It's really I think I, the fact that he's slightly I, undersized. I completely agree with that because he does. He has uh, my one friend even, which this is obviously high praise, but when he first came in, said he's almost like a mini. Like he seems like he was learning a little bit when he first came in from Niski. Because if you looked at how Niski would play and how Mark would play, they kind of took it simple yeah. as can be, kind of did the same type of thing. It seemed like he kind of learned from him as soon as he came up. And he kind of said it seems like a mini Niskanen type thing there. If you can keep well, being patient with him and let him develop, you might get a poor man's Niskanen type guy, which is still a very good NHL defenseman, because Matt Niskanen was a very good NHL defenseman. You would have a good one if it's a little lesser version of him. So how do you see the pairings playing out with uh, Friedman entering the lineup? Yeah, it's going to be interesting because of, Bra- like, I don't know if I want to put Braun with Gus. That's the only problem. Like, that's what's kind of... <laughs> I think if I was perfectly content with putting Justin with Gus then it would be that, and then Provy and Sandheim have worked well together, and then I would do Hag and Freeman because I think those two would work well together. My, the, thing, the only thing that puts me in a bind is I don't know how well Justin Braun's going to pair with Gus, like if he's actually going to work like he did with Vlasic, and then he's able to kind of be the back man a little bit more like he was in San Jose. and let. Yeah. But Vlasic's also a lot more... <laughs> um, in his own zone, decent than, than Eric Gustafson. So, like, right. is he going to be able to be a little bit of that? So that's why that's a definition of concern for me. But for me going into the first game, I would just roll with that and then just switch it like AV always does anyway. If you see the first couple of times, yeah. Ron doesn't look that great because you're playing the Bruins. The Bruins have injuries, but they do still have skilled players. So you're going to find out pretty quick early if the D-line's not working that well. So. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's kind of what, Yarif, you touched on it earlier where you said too where the team kind of played, you know, not not so well. It looked like they were playing um, back in, in when they came back from the, uh, you know, from the break. Yeah. Like they just kind of were just lackadaisically skating around. They weren't really, you know, nobody was really hunkered down or anything like that. It was like, really this is what we're gonna see again like you guys are going back to this again it's like i don't understand why they why i just but i'm also gonna say this in spite of all of that and in spite of all the shortcomings and everything like that this is the best start that the flyers have had their first four games in a really long time okay so yeah we're we're passionate about the team because we want to see the team do well because we know they have the talent and we know that they can do better and we know that they're playing down to teams i mean seriously six to one to buffalo come on i mean really yeah that, i mean you should be pasting them <laughs> last teams. year last year they lost to a non-nhl team which uh embarrassingly so <laughs> yeah, that had a great season. So I mean, you know, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> okay, I can't be case. the only one seeing this. No, well, no, well, not. It, go ahead, Yuri. No, I was just say it's just not an indication. I think you nailed it, Joe. It's just an indication of where the season's really going to go. That's where I'm like, what I look to see now is the way the team responds. So I look for like, okay, after you get shelled six one, you come in, the team has momentum, you hold it off. And then you you slowly and I saw I mean I if you look at my tweets you, you can see I'm like okay Flyers have officially taken over this game and you can see yep, yep. where they start and this is what they did last season instill their will on their opposition Ooh. when they would set their mind to being like we're gonna win this game they would win 
I mean, you saw what te- everybody saw what Tampa Bay did last year. Yes, they're extremely talented, but they were a very determined team. There's not a single team in the league that was going to oh, get in I, their way. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's tough to outwork a Barry Trotz team, that's for sure. Okay, and and that's exactly what Tampa Bay did is came out and basically outworked them. And that's why they were able to hoist the cup. Okay, yeah, I mean, yeah. in my opinion, in my opinion. And so I agree with you 100 percent, Yurif. I, I like the bounce back. I like the, you know, you face a little bit of adversity. You got spanked a little bit there. Uh, let's see how you play coming back to next night. Here's going to be the kicker, though, with this whole year and this season and the way the games are set up now is you're going to get a chance to do that now against the same bloody team, right? Because almost every single one of the games that the Flyers have scheduled are back-to-backs or a stretch of games with the same set of teams. That's just the way the schedule is. So now the Flyers have a shot where, like, you know, okay, you lay an egg against Buffalo, but, well, you better be – coming back to next game and you better have a little bit of fire in your belly and, and you better be able to do exactly what your says and take over the game. Exactly. And they were able to respond. I, I mean, I said it in my um, post game reaction. I did to the six to one when I started previewing the next game. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I never, I never see this team with a V having back to back game of that nature. I just never see it happening and they haven't yet. So yeah. And I, that, until I'm proven wrong, I'm just going to keep going with that uh, mantra there. But I just think around the league, when you've looked, I paid attention to at least most condensed games through NHL TV. If I ever watched them, there's been a lot more scoring early. And they yeah. talked about uh, as a as a whole like segment thing when EJ Raddick was on NHL Network too. They talked about it for like a couple minutes because it's going to be more open. Usually defense is kind of what settles in and comes to you last. It's kind of like if you had no preseason in football, when you had the lesser, you saw defenses with the lesser preseasons kind of settle in last. It's the same type of thing. Normally your offense, your feet are going, your adrenaline's pumping. You're going to be going in the offensive zone like a rocket ship. But you have to settle into the actual works and quirks of the game and positioning and where you're supposed to be. You have to remember that after months on end of not playing to be very sound defensively. Sometimes that takes a little bit to get back because that's the mental side of it, not just the ha. let me go right after you and attack you um, player mentality. So that's why I think you've seen a lot more. We've seen a lot of 5-4 games early on, a lot of at least seven goal totals, a lot of eight goal total games. After I think one got like a nine goal. To- so there's been a lot of high scoring games already. And I think it's just something all these teams are trying to get hone in their defense, which normally is the last thing that comes to fruition, especially when you haven't even had pra- practicing preseason <laughs> games. All you do is scrimmage yourself. So – that's, yeah. I think, a huge effect that you reef hinted at earlier. Goalies, too, is another issue, too, where it takes a little while for them to kind of get into their form, get into, you know, facing the puck. Plus the fact that you've had how many teams now who haven't played since last March? Exactly. And yeah. then there's also been a larger gap between, like, the teams that were out in the early rounds of the playoffs and in the bubble – they haven't played for a longer period of time compared to, say, like Tampa Bay and Dallas. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I think that's another thing, too, that's affecting. And I also think, too, that what both you and Yarif pointed out, that because there's no training camp and you don't have those. Because what? Normally, training camp is a couple weeks. You get six or seven games. You know, you have different color squads that play different games in the whole nine yards. And But, but that wasn't the case this year. And so you're going to see those first three or four games going to be everybody kind of getting on the same page. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. What were you going to say, Yarif? Yeah, I was going to say maybe even more than just the first three or four games. We, we, Some I, teams, I, I, yeah. We, yeah, no, no, that's a great point. And I would say that the teams that can get it together the quickest are probably the ones that are going to at least take the lead in the standings. Um, and I, I do believe the Flyers are going to be at the top of the division by the end of the, the, the beginning sprint here. And if... I would say if there are moves to be made, um, I would say the Flyers probably are looking for a defenseman of some sort. So if the Flyers do find themselves at the top of this division and you see that maybe some teams have dropped off, 
Um, we could see moves before the trade deadline. I actually heard, shout out to Bill Matz for this one. Um, I heard him on I thought he had a great point. Uh, the fact that moves might be made because of the quarantine period, that you might actually want to make trades knowing that you need a two-week window. So you might not actually wait till the trade yeah, deadline. Yeah. Um, so we might see some of these kind of weird moves ahead of time. We saw that Ian Cole trade. The other day, um, teams are going to be missing stuff. So as soon as there's like kind of a separation going on, which we won't see for a little bit, um, I think it'll be quiet. But eventually, I do think we'll see some moves, and I think the Flyers will go out and unless Matt, they can convince Matt Niskanen to come out of retirement, which I mean, fingers crossed, mm. this team probably will need another defenseman mm. um, to play in that top four. There's also the caveat that Ghost rebounds, and I know that people might laugh at that. But there are previous seasons, and I don't think it's a coincidence that Ghost was being tried with Provov, where the two of those look like an elite. It, it was like Seth Jones and Wierenski. Like, everybody was talking about them. I remember it very well. They were the envy of the league, especially when one of them had 17 goals, the other one had 65 points. You know what I mean? They were dominant as a pairing. So if that happens to work out, then maybe they don't need to make a trade. And then everybody can cry when Ghost gets taken an expansion. <laughs> well, they yeah. did see. I did see that they brought up that uh, guy that they picked up in the off season. Uh, Pullet has been brought into uh, or moved up to the uh, the taxi squad or yep. whatever that is, so that he can he can enter into that. I guess that protocol, right? That's how that has to work. Is that you have True. to go go into that to enter the protocol? So that's why you see. That's why, and I agree with what you're saying, Arif. Because I think you're going to see teams make those moves sooner because of that very reason. Because you, as, even if you're on the taxi squad, you have to be able to be with the team and all the other stuff. So that means you have to follow protocol in order to get, you know, what is it, three, uh, have three negative tests or something like that in the span of a couple of days or whatever the case is or whatever their protocols are for them to be on the team. So I do agree. I think you're going to see some potential moves. But – uh, I like with what uh, they're doing so far, and who knows? Could be interesting to see. Yeah, yeah, I do agree with that. I think that's a very good point. With the um, COVID and everything, it, it would make sense to uh, trade for some guys early because you have to pass all the tests and everything. Is the two-week thing standard, though, for each team? I thought that was more because of Canada. When you have the connection with Canada, they have to wait. To, like, if... With the Greg Pattern and Ian Cole, since that's both in the States, isn't that just the three negative tests? I, I would imagine. I don't think that there is a, a necessary a law, but I think that their recommendation is uh, seven yeah, to 14 that's right. days of isolation. Yeah, 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 there you go. Like, uh, like right now, go. yeah, for the same reason we don't see ghosts. Like, we don't know the situation with ghosts. He might have COVID, right? I mean, I had COVID at one point, too. If it affects him in a similar way, it affects me, at least majority of people, right, especially healthy person. He should get over it within a few days, you know, however his body processes it. And then he needs at least a week from the last time he had symptoms. So they do 7 to 10 well, days, 7 to 14 those, days. So I meant for the trade, though, because well, Patterson and Cole, neither of them had COVID. So it would be, couldn't that just be the three negative tests and then you could? Potentially. Whatever the, whatever the protocols are going to be. Right. Well, that's what I was saying, potentially, but they might rule on the side of caution anyway. Gotcha. Because okay. sometimes it takes four days for the virus to even come up on a test. Do you see what I'm saying? I got so you. maybe it's a minute a week. You're like you had it, it'll be less, but there's going to be some delay. It's it's almost like no matter what, you have to wait a week. You know, it's like some, yeah. some stupid yeah, thing like that. I, thought, whether you like it or I not. just thought the two-week thing was, uh, was with Canada because when Elliot Friedman brought up how much longer Edmonton has to wait for their goalies than some other teams would have to if they claimed – a goalie. That's the reason why I thought it was that's just a little. Probably bit true. Canada. I, that's but. probably true. They have different laws than than we do, right? Well, yeah. and that's another thing too. That with when you look at Huboden, he because he was coming in from another country. He wasn't coming in from Canada, but he was coming in from another country. You know, and the same thing with uh, Kapanen for Pittsburgh, right? They were both yeah. coming in from different countries, so whatever the protocols are going to be from them coming in from another country. That's the thing that we have to consider. Now, look, I understand that the coal trade was done, you know, within the United States and both of those guys were, you know, in playing with teams and, you know, have already tested. So I don't know how they're going to do that. I, I imagine that they're probably with each of their teams and going through whatever their protocols are. You know what I mean? So. 
Yeah, yeah, I would have to agree with that. I think um, it's definitely going to be an interesting trade deadline. I think it's going to be an interesting <clears throat> season with that. You you definitely a good point of pointing that out because you might see a lot more inklings of people moving early, especially for guys maybe like Arizona, if they start to teeter since there's obviously been rumors of one of their two goaltenders going to somebody or both, and then Aiden Hill might end up starting. But either way, um, there's been rumors with their goaltending down there. So there's been lots of fun rumors. Um, But to close this one out uh, as we wrap up here, I just wanted to touch on, you brought it up earlier, Reef. how impressive that, or, well, not, well, also the NAK, Lawton, and Raffle, and just our bottom six, really, because AV doesn't call it a bottom six, but when you look at it on the uh, roster sheet on most things, they have the, uh, obviously, Raffle, Lawton, and Knack line, and then Oscar, Patrick, and Konechny usually listed as such, but I love how he does that and doesn't call anything the said line, because that just would motivate me as a player, even, which, like, none of our lines are the first line. You just do what you do this line does this this line does this this line's better that's just a much better tactic in my opinion because it makes everyone just focus in on their strengths and it doesn't make them think well i gotta work harder to get up to the i want to get up to blah 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 line you're just going i work well with this i work well in this system let me do that and we've seen the tk and uh patrick and Lindblom line um three points from each nolan and oscar and then you already have six uh, one of the leading scorers in the league in Travis Konechny so far coming off of a breakout season uh, last year. So it looks like he might break out more if it continues to uh, go this stretch this year. And then uh, Michael Roffle, who's a guy that is the veteran guy that some people thought, including myself, but might get pushed out by younger guys, has been great so far uh, early on, along with uh, Lox and uh, Abel. So... Um, it, it, it's great to see uh, those lines really come into fruition. And until Couturier comes back, when we put Fairby, Hayes, and Voracek together towards part of last game, that seemed to kind of work a little bit where Jake, of course, was able to get a nice goal there. Um, I think maybe that could work for the time being. So I do like how AV's moving around. But those bottom two lines, I'm in love with uh, – well, not that we don't call them the bottom two. Those two lines, I'm in love with – those two lines of uh, Limblum, Patrick, Konechny, Raffle, Law, Nabe, Kubel. As long as none of those guys gets injured, fingers crossed, uh, we should be pretty good uh, with being able to forecheck and play decent defense via those two and get good pressure in the offensive zone via the Limblum, Patrick, and Konechny line, obviously. But what are your guys' uh, final thoughts? I'll send it to your reef first for this one. Yeah, I mean, uh, overall, I think it's a complete luxury. We talk about it over and over again, but this team is incredibly deep. Um, even with the injuries, um, we're still a competitive team. I mean, God forbid anymore. We don't need that. Um, it obviously hurt. But I do, I, I mean, I agree with everything you said. It's it, There is no bottom six on this team. I would say maybe there's a fourth line, you know, to to your point. And you could say Lawton is... Lawton, Raffle, and NAK, but none of those guys are pure fourth-line players. I mean, Raffle maybe now because he's at the end of his career. Um, Lawton clearly is not. Uh, he he can play in the top six if you need him to. Uh, NAK is producing um, at a young age and is probably on his way to be more of a third line, maybe even a, a point producer at some point. Um, so there's a, just a robust amount of talent. Uh, the one thing I think... It's almost like we have like three second lines and a fourth line kind of in a way, if that makes sense. But I do think that as the season rolls on, I, I do think AV will move away from that. Um, I think he started last year that way as well. And I think he'll end up creating his like true top line, um, probably keeping that Patrick uh, Lindblom and Konechny line together because that seems like a line of the future. Um, and I think Joel Farabee essentially works with everybody, but there is something with him and yep. Hayes at this point where the two of them just play really well, especially in a third line role. If you had to play him as a shutdown line, and if JVR True. continues to do what he's doing, like again, the, the the options are just there to stack up lines, like throw Voracek back up there if you want, or move him around. But there's so many options, so like I don't have a problem with anything you said. I mean, if those are the lines moving forward, we're gonna see it. But I just I really do see. We're going to see players tried in all these different ways, and then as the season rolls on, they'll probably stick with probably something similar to what we had in the playoffs before, which will be stack your your top lines. Like We even see that with the top pairing, and Jamie and I were talking about this, and I, I Jamie and I both agree 
that Sanheim is the second best defenseman on this team. I don't doubt that he is the second best guy. He can handle the minutes the best. My whole thing is I want to see Myers on there because I want Sanheim to anchor the second unit. You know, like a lot of what you're talking about, balancing it out. So we'll see how they kind of go with that. You see it. They're going to they're gonna play that, that line like 28 minutes a night. You know, it, it depends on how they do it. And if they plan on overplaying a line, you know, they might throw Couturier, Giroux, and either TK or Voracek or whatever, you know, but they might stack up again. Um, if the, Especially if the team is scoring all around and everybody's confident, you know, they might play around things even more. Just understand all those combinations and be able to rely on them in the playoffs. But overall, I would say the fact that we have so many different options is what I'm happy about. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm definitely Gosh, happy about that yeah. as well. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, no, can't can't argue with you on that one, man. They're, these are all good problems to have. Right. Okay, and let's face it. The Flyers, we, we haven't had this issue in a, quite a long time. The Flyers haven't been this deep in quite a long time. Okay, mm -hmm. and it's starting to show where the players that, you know, okay, we're, we're missing Sean Couturier. Looks like we might be missing uh, Myers and, and Frost. Is, we might, you know, it depends on how things go with that. Who knows? Um, but look, people associate top lines with the amount of money that you make. And that's the way it's been throughout the entire, well, for the most part. That's, that's the culture. That's the way things have been. Uh, you know, you're making the big bucks, you're on the top line. Okay. And I really, this is why I really like what AV has done, where he has removed that stigma where, okay, yeah, Giroux's making some of the most money on the team, but he's not, you know, he's not starting on the top line every night. You know what I mean? That's just not the case. He plays you to where your strengths are. He puts you together where he thinks you're going to gel. He puts the lines together that thinks you're going to do well. He He's seen these guys now for – this is his second year. He's had a third camp, if you will, now with these same guys, more guys coming in and new, you know, a couple of new guys coming in for the most part. But – the same guys. He's seen these guys now. He knows how to play them. He knows what's going on. And I like the fact that he take taken away that stigma and gone, yeah, there's no one, two, three, four line. The fact that we're able to roll four lines, the, that that to me right there, and, and the fact that, that we're just able to, okay, Couturier goes down, okay, next guy steps in, okay, and we're just still able to roll four lines and we're still able to be productive. That's that's what I think has been impressive as far as that's concerned. I also really like what Travis Konechny has been able to do um, in his uh, first few games coming out this year after being so silent uh, in the playoffs. Um, also really liked the the steam of the captain coming out, Giroux. He he seems like he's been a bit of a man possessed. He's been flying around and hitting things, making good plays and passes. He doesn't have a goal on the stat sheet yet, but he's got three assists, so I have a feeling that that goal is just going to come anytime soon. So I, I, I like this fact that we have these horrible problems about such, oh gosh, the fact that we have to talk about, oh, this player has to slot in and Oh, he's playing really well. Well, good. So I like the team moving forward so far. Yeah, it's good to have problems that are because you have too much people rather than the problems of the past where we didn't have enough people. That's definitely a great way to put it. But like I said, I think Harden or 6-2, I think it was a 5-2 yeah, win afterwards, uh, looked good. He might have had that one blunder, and then obviously Moose looked amazing. Uh, in yesterday's game. And, yes, you're supposed to say his name like that all the time. Um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, but the uh, the big thing now is we've been, other than the one Buffalo game, having at least one was an empty net, but the Flyers have 15 goals in four games. The Bruins have four in three games. So the one thing that's going to be interesting coming into this, this series with Boston to wrap up our video is the two games. Are the Bruins going to find their scoring, or is the Flyers still going to be the better scoring team and the Bees? Yeah even while having some chances for some reason, just haven't been able to capitalize early on uh, this season. 
Um, Yarif, I'll turn it over to you for that as our wrap-up thing on predicting how we're doing with this series. But what do you think about that? The Bruins' scoring output has been pretty uh, piss poor early, where ours has been bad one game, but otherwise not too shabby. Well, I know they're I know they're missing Pasty, so that's obviously a huge loss. Uh, the loss yeah. of Krug and Char. I've talked about. It. I expected the Bruins to take a step back for quite you know for a while. Um, I mean for this off season. Um, so I probably expect them to score more. I, I wouldn't to continue on that route. They're not a bad team, so if they didn't score so far, they probably do. Similar to how the Flyers kind of got caught, so we don't want to get trapped thinking that they're not going to produce. If anything, this could be the game that they break out, right? So I, I would assume um, if I was going into that situation, I would play even tighter defense and know that they're going to be very hungry for a goal um, and they're going to be probably crashing the net quite a bit. So I would m- maybe even consider going with Elliott first um, just because he's coming off that big game. Oh, yeah. Um, but I, I do, you know, I tend to always lean on Hart just because I know the talent is there with Hart and he's just a game stealer so um i don't think it's a huge issue at least at the moment but i do expect to bring an a game against boston because good teams like this they don't stay bad right so things will level out and uh, just like we saw against buffalo you know like you can't go in expecting them to give you you know a, an okay effort like expect that your <laughs> opponent's gonna bring it as yeah, hard as they true. can that's, that's kind of the season we have right now and it, it's yeah. it's gonna get chippy it's gonna it's gonna be a really ugly year i mean for exactly true. You know, look, Boston, Boston is not going to be, I agree, I think Boston is going to take a step back. But when you come from being the President's Trophy winning team the previous year, um, taking a step back, I still think they're going to be a dangerous team. And and even though they, they may not be that President's Trophy winning team this year, I still think they're going to be a dangerous team. And I think that once they... <clears throat> overcome their little bit of adversity here because they've had some turnover and because of injury and things of that nature. So I think once they come out of that, I think they're going to be uh, more of the Boston that I think that we're kind of expecting them to be because I think with the opening game and then, you know, the loss of Chara, I mean, you don't just lose Chara after 14 years. He was your captain. He was one of your best D men. And you don't just, okay, well, so let's just, throw more in and McAvoy and, you know, Clifton and Carlo and, hey, hey there are replacements. Uh, no. You know what I mean? So uh, it's going to take them a couple games, but I think it's going to be – this is going to be, I think, one of the best games so far of the early season um, coming up right here. I really do because Boston's coming out hangry, <laughs> if I could <laughs> say that, hangry. Right. And Philly, OK, they they didn't play their best game against Buffalo. They they kind of came back there it, and took over the game uh, for the second game against Buffalo. But now they're playing up in Boston. And so this is the first away game. And I, I do. Uh, I'm going to lean on Hart. I want to see how he does on the away games. We saw last year how well he played at home. I want to see him be the away guy too. I don't want to have to lean on Elliot to be always having to play the away games or, you know, that kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? So I do agree. I, I like going with the hot hand because, man, let's face it, Elliot, 40 shots, you know, straight up. But I think you play him the second night. In my opinion, or that, that's just, just kind of how I'm looking at it. I want to see Carter get back on the horse. And so I think, you, in my opinion, you sure. play Carter the first night and then play Elliot the next. I, I would have no disagreements with that. Yeah. I don't think, uh, I, I will say this real quick. And sorry, Joe, let me just cut up. I will yeah, say this. Yeah. I don't think Carter Hart has a problem with the away games. I think all of that yeah. was a complete coincidence and all yeah. of those games lost were after. Lindblom uh, was diagnosed with cancer. I think if you really look at Carter Hart's entire career, there's zero uh, trend there. Yeah, with home yeah, away. yeah. Um, well, outside of the one game, doing better tail half of last season. Yeah, too. I, so, I yeah. don't think there's a real trend. Though I do understand why you say that, Steele. Not to, not to shit on you. No, 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 no. no it's, that's okay because I want to see him. We haven't necessarily seen him per se. Yeah, more if you have you know more insight to the team. But if you're on the outside looking in this is going to be an adversity game for him. You know what I mean? In my opinion, you know what I mean? From the outside looking in. 
Well, your reef did make a good point though, coming into this Boston series, you should expect more spunk from them. Cause there was actually more spunk from them on Sunday yeah. against the Islanders, but then yeah, Seth yeah. More Lomboff just decided that they weren't winning that hockey game. I, yeah. Pretty uh, much. So, so uh, they, uh, Islanders ended up winning one to nothing cause they got outshot by, by 10 and only had teams shots. They didn't have 20 shots. So that was all defense and really not even all, all goaltending and some defense for uh, a normally very good defensive led trots team. So if they're it, who obviously you got to guard the most are the Bergerons and Mark Sands of the world. If you're able to contain them and then DeBrusque, who's developing, who's up on their line then you should be pretty set. Morshan has been the one that has really got off to a nice start for them, playing well, has three points in three games, and wasn't even supposed to be starting the season. So he is obviously the guy you always have to look out for. He annoys you. You don't want to get in that mindset with him. And then Berge's just one of the more consistent guys. So those would be the two guys you have to look out for. But I agree with you. I think Boston's adjusting from their defense. When you lose a Krug and uh, Chara, that's a huge adjustment. When now you have to have Brandon Carlo, who I think eventually could step up more. But now they're having guys kind of play all on different lines to have Carlo try to anchor the second line with guys that maybe should be on a different line. So they're still trying to figure out what the heck's going on there with their defense. But I think it's going to be a fun series. I agree with Steel Flyers. Boston usually always brews pretty good games with some animosity. So they do definitely have a chance to be some of the best games of the season. And we have two of the better duos in net. Uh, Obviously they won the uh, Jennings. uh, I think it was last year. Um, and so they have some of one of the better goalie duos. And then we have a duo that Moose always steps up for us. And then we have Carter Hart. So you're going to see a battle of two very good goalies, whether both starters go both games or they actually do the backup since there is a day off in between there. Uh, it's going to be good either way. So I'm definitely excited to see how these two teams match up. I definitely think the Flyers are going to come out with one win going into this series. Um, and, uh, Potentially two, depending if Boston keeps I'll buy playing. That. Like they did. I'll buy but that. I'm predicting definitely at least one. I don't think we're. I don't think with how Boston's playing early, we'll be able to pressure their defense kind of like we pressured Pittsburgh's a little bit, who is also a defense yeah. that's kind of trying to figure themselves out with some new acquisitions they brought in and different things. I think it might be a little similar to that game one. Um, so I feel like we'll be able to definitely get a game. But uh, what do you guys think on the series prediction? One for two or two for two? Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, I think one for two sounds appropriate just with the injuries. If the Flyers were healthy, I'd say they'd be able to take both. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, depending yeah. on what we find out with what's going on here. Um, and I also agree with what Joe said, too. It doesn't matter if Halak plays or Vrask plays. It doesn't matter if Elliott plays or, or Hart plays. I think either way you slice it, those are some pretty darn good goalies uh, no matter what. So that's always going to give you a shot to win. So... Uh, I do agree, though. I'm going to go one, one and one. I think we win one and 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 maybe drop one. Yeah, and I do think the one we drop in this one will be a very good battle of a game. That I don't think it'll be anything reminding of the Buffalo series. I think it will be a close one that we probably end up like dropping to Boston, like it always happens. We get one of those late goals that banks off someone's shin pad. Five and to like, four. Oh, uh, like, yeah, one of those things. Um, so, but that's the way I look at it too. But guys, thank you so much for joining the video. This has been our reaction to our Philadelphia flyer season this far while sprinkling in some other NHL knowledge on you from around the league with some team. I really want to thank your reef for joining us from flyers, Check them out there. And your reef, what's your Twitter for everyone to check you out on? Yeah, you can follow me at Y Wallach, Y W O L O K on Twitter. Obviously follow flyers, nitty gritty, my brand. Jamie Basco and I, and obviously Joe writes for us as well. Um, yeah, feel free to follow us on there and also check out YouTube. That's where a lot of my content is uh, on YouTube, flyersnittygritty.com. And Joe will be on there periodically doing videos as well. Yeah, check out uh, Lurif's Gritty Ranch and all the stuff he does on there are absolutely awesome. Definitely check him out on the Flyers Nitty Gritty YouTube. And then we have uh, Steel Flyers at Steel Flyers 52 on Twitter, steelflyers.com. Check him out on his pages on there. And you can also find in the Friends of Steel Flyers all the information for Flyers Nitty Gritty as well. So, everybody, we thank you for joining us today. I'm Joe Borick from Sports Fanatic News. This has been the reaction to the Flyers season this far. Three and one to start, baby. Anytime, anywhere. Let's bring the anytime, anywhere into Boston. Peace out, everybody.
like that.